Asia Pacific region. Recent weeks have witnessed intentionally provocative words and actions from the North Korean regime. We're all concerned that the decades of self-imposed isolation of North Korean leaders, and especially the cruel, erratic behavior of its current leader, make confrontation potentially more likely. In my view, we must work even more closely with our key allies, Japan and the Republic of Korea. We must continue to encourage China to help put North Korea on a different path and we must increase our military presence and capability in the region. Enhanced missile defense is especially important. Of course, none of us wants another military conflict on the Korean Peninsula. But we must also remember the lessons of the past. As T.R. Fehrenbach wrote on the first page of his classic history on the Korean War, this kind of war, Quote, storm signals have been flying for more than four years, but the West did not prepare for trouble. It did not make ready because its peoples in their heart of hearts did not want to be prepared, end quote. Well, whether we want it or not, we have to be prepared. Of course, North Korea is not the only concern in the PACOM area. China continues to build islands in the South China Sea and to militarize them. The future direction of the Philippines is unclear, and we're moving toward a closer relationship with new and developing allies like Vietnam. All of this and more are on the plate of our PACOM commander, Admiral Harry Harris, whom we are pleased to welcome today. Before turning to him, I'd yield to the distinguished ranking member, Mr. Smith, for any comments he'd like to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Admiral Harris, for being here and for your leadership in the Pacific. And I agree with the Chairman's comments about the importance of the region. Uh, U.S. presence in that region has never been more important. Our presence working with our allies can be a calming influence in what is a very unstable place, as the Chairman described. Uh, and most disturbing and most concerning, obviously, is North Korea. Um, I would say I think I don't think we're ignoring it this time. Um, this is not like uh, the first Korean War. I think there's been a great deal of attention paid to this um, problem in North Korea uh, for several administrations. And I, I think that's, that's helpful because the number one biggest thing that we need is a clear deterrent to North Korea. We are not going to make Kim Jong-un a rational leader. Uh, we are not going to make North Korea anything other than a pariah state anytime soon, nor are we going to stop them from having some military capability. Uh, we are aware that they've already developed a nuclear bomb. But the one thing we can do is make it clear that we stand with our allies in the region, with South Korea and Japan in particular, and we will be a credible deterrent to any military action in North Korea. I think that's the most important thing to do, is to make it clear to Kim Jong-un that if he does anything, we have the power and the will to respond and destroy him. Because the only positive thing I can think about North Korea is that there's no evidence that their regime is suicidal. Um, they don't want to be taken out. So we have to make sure we maintain a credible deterrent. Uh, and China fits into this as well. Uh, China wants uh, increased influence in Asia. And on a certain level, that's understanding, uh, understandable. They are a growing power. Um, they want to have influence. What we need to do is to work with them to make sure that that influence is for positive instead of for ill, and North Korea is a very, very good place to start. Um, they could be a lot more helpful than they've been being on calming those tensions, and it's in their best interests. Um, they don't want war to break out uh, in North Korea uh, any more than anybody else does. It would have a far more devastating impact on their interests. So there are a lot of challenges. I'll just close by saying I think there are also a lot of opportunities. The chairman alluded uh, to some of those. Um, we have a lot of allies in the region, and a lot of those relationships are growing. Um, I would also mention, uh, well, I'm not sure, I India and South Asia is certainly a, an ally and one that could become even more so. Um, Australia, there are a lot of countries in that part of the world that want to work with us and that give us an opportunity to work together to make that place in the world a more peaceful place. And with that, I look forward uh, to the Admiral's testimony. I thank him for his leadership and for his attendance today. Admiral, again, thank you for being with us. You're recognized for any comments you'd like to make. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Chairman Thornberry, Representative Smith, and distinguished members. Uh, it's an honor for me to appear again before this committee. 
There are many things to talk about since 14 months ago. Uh, I do regret that I'm not here with my testimony battle buddy, uh, U.S. Forces Command Commander uh, General Vince Brooks, but I think you all agree that he's where he's needed most right now uh, on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, unfortunately for all of you, that means my opening statement is going to be just a tad longer. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for your reference to T.R. Fehrenbach's book, uh, This Kind of War, which is on the PACOM reading list. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I request that my written posture statement be submitted for the record. Admiral, we, without objection, it'll be part of the record. I have to say, not to you, but to other folks, we got it about 9 o'clock last night, uh, which means nobody's read it. Uh, as well as uh, General Brooks' statement. So again, not directed to you, but to all of the layers that such written statements have to go through, um, they need to be more timely for this committee if they're going to be relevant to our hearing. If it's just putting words down on paper, then fine. Uh, but but uh, we need to do better in, future, in the future and I needed to say that, again, not directed to you, but, but uh, at, at those who uh, uh, seem to not have a, a, a sense of promptness. So without objection, so ordered. Please Thanks. continue. Thanks. Uh, as a PACOM commander, I have the extraordinary privilege of leading approximately 375,000 soldiers, sailors, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, uh, airmen, and, and uh, DOD civilians serving our nation around half the globe. These dedicated patriots are really doing an amazing job, and thanks to them, America remains a security partner of choice in the region. That's important because I believe that America's future security and, and economic prosperity are indelibly linked to the Indo-Asia Pacific region, uh, and it's a, it's a region that's poised at a strategic nexus where opportunity meets the four challenges of North Korea, China, Russia, and ISIS. It's clear to me that ISIS is a threat that must be destroyed now. The main focus of our coalition's effort is rightfully in the Middle East and North Africa, but as we eliminate ISIS in these areas, some of the surviving fighters will likely repatriate to their home countries uh, in the Indo-Asia Pacific. And what's worse, they'll be radicalized and weaponized. So we must eradicate ISIS before it grows in the PACOM area of responsibility. Then there's North Korea, which remains the most immediate threat to the security of the United States and our allies uh, in the Indo-Asia Pacific. This week, North Korea threatened Australia with a nuclear strike, a powerful reminder to the entire international community that North Korea's missiles point in every direction. The only nation to have tested nuclear devices in this century, North Korea has vigorously pursued an aggressive weapons test schedule with more than 60 ballistic missile events in recent years. With every test, Kim Jong-un moves closer to his stated goal of a preemptive nuclear strike capability against American cities, and he's not afraid to fail in public. Defending our homeland is my top priority, so I must assume that the Kim Jong-un's nuclear claims are true. I know his aspirations certainly are, and that should provide all of us a sense of urgency, urgency to ensure PACOM and U.S. Forces Korea are prepared to fight tonight with the best technology on the planet. That's why General Brooks and I are doing everything possible to defend the American homeland and our allies in the Republic of Korea and Japan. That's why the Rock us Alliance decided last July to deploy THAAD, that's a terminal high-altitude area defense system, which will be operational in the coming days and able to, to better defend South Korea against the growing North Korea threat. That's why the USS Carl Vinson Carrier Strike Group is back on patrol in Northeast Asia. That's why we must continue to debut America's newest and best military platforms in the Indo-Asia Pacific. That's why we continue to emphasize trilateral cooperation between Japan, South Korea, and the United States, a partnership with a purpose if there ever was one. And that's why we continue to call on China to exert its considerable economic influence to stop Pyongyang's unprecedented weapons testing. While recent actions by Beijing are encouraging and welcome, the fact remains that China is as responsible for where North Korea is today as North Korea itself. In confronting the reckless North Korean regime, it's critical that we're guided by a strong sense of resolve, both privately and publicly, both diplomatically and militarily. As President Trump and Secretary Mattis have made clear, all options are on the table. We want to bring Kim Jong-un to his senses, not to his knees. 
We're also challenged in the Indo-Asia Pacific by an aggressive China and a revanchist Russia, neither of whom seem to respect the international agreements they've signed on to. For instance, the arbitral tribunal in The Hague ruled last year that China's so-called nine-dash line claim is illegal under the Law of the Sea Convention. Despite being a signatory to the convention, China ignored this legally binding peaceful arbitration. In fact, China continues a methodical strategy to control the South China Sea. I testified last year that China was militarizing this critical international waterway and the airspace above it by building air and naval bases on seven Chinese man-made islands in the disputed Spratleys. Despite subsequent Chinese assurances that they would not militarize these bases, today they now have facilities that support long-range weapons emplacements, fighter aircraft hangars, radar towers, and barracks for troops. China's militarization of the South China Sea is real. I'm also not taking my eyes off Russia, which just last week flew bomber missions near Alaska on successive days for the first time since 2014. Russia continues to modernize its military and exercise its considerable conventional and nuclear forces in the Pacific. So despite the region's four significant challenges, since my last report to you, we've strengthened America's network of alliances and partnerships. Working with like-minded partners on shared security threats like North Korea and ISIS is a key component to our regional strategy. Of five bilateral defense treaty alliances, our five bilateral uh, defense treaty alliances anchor our joint force efforts in the Indo-Asia Pacific. So I continue to rely on Australia for its advanced military capabilities across all domains and its leadership in global operations. As Vice President Pence and Secretary Mattis reaffirmed during recent trips to Northeast Asia, our alliance with South Korea remains steadfast and our alliance with Japan has never been stronger. Even with some turbulence this past year with the Philippines, I'm pleased that we're proceeding with the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement and we're looking forward to conducting the Balikatan exercise with our Filipino allies next month. And this past February, I visited Thailand to reaffirm our enduring alliance and to communicate that we look forward to Thailand's reemergence as a flourishing democracy. We've also advanced our partnerships with regional powers like India and Indonesia, Malaysia, New Zealand, Singapore, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, and many others, all with a view toward reinforcing the rules-based security order that has helped underwrite peace and prosperity throughout the region for decades. But there's more work to be done. We must be ready to confront all challenges from a position of strength and with credible combat power. So I ask this committee to support continued investment to improve our military capabilities. I need weapon systems of increased lethality, precision, speed, and range that are networked and cost-effective. And restricting ourselves with funding uncertainties reduces warfighting readiness, so I urge the Congress to repeal sequestration and to approve the proposed Defense Department budget. Finally, I'd like to thank the Congress for proposing and supporting the Asia-Pacific Stability Initiative. This effort will reassure our regional partners and send a strong signal to potential adversaries of our persistent commitment to the region. As always, I thank Congress for your enduring support to the men and women of PACOM and to our families who care for us. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, let me just remind all members that immediately upon the conclusion of this open hearing, we will have a closed classified session with Admiral Harris. And it will happen immediately after this uh, open hearing has concluded. I know in, in, when we've done this before, there's been some confusion about time, apparently. So whenever we finish, we'll be upstairs um, as, as we, we usually do. Um, Admiral, I appreciate your very strong comments about budgets. Um, obviously, that's a key importance to us this week, and no one suffers the consequences of our uh, failure to do our job than you do on, on the front lines. I want to ask my questions on, on defending against missiles, and, and actually I want to ask it uh, in, in two different areas. Uh, you described some additional forces that we are putting into the uh, region. I know there have been some press reports that say 
that somehow those forces are not able to defend against missiles launched from North Korea. Uh, let me just ask, can American military forces in that region defend themselves against missiles launched from North Korea? Mr. Chairman, absolutely. Uh, there was an article that, uh, that came out this morning uh, from one of the outlets that suggested that the Carl Vinson strike group, and I think it's appropriate that we're talking about the Carl Vinson here in this room, the, the Carl Vinson room, that uh, the Carl Vinson strike group, with its incredible capability uh, to include two uh, guided missile destroyers, the Wayne Ian Meyer and the Michael Murphy, uh, and the Link Champlain uh, cruiser, uh, that somehow uh, that, that uh, carrier strike group uh, would not be able to defend itself uh, against ballistic missiles. Uh, I believe that article and articles like that uh, are both uh, misleading uh, and they conflate apples and oranges, if you will. Uh, we have ballistic missile uh, ships uh, in the Sea of Japan, in the East Sea, uh, that are capable of defending against ballistic missile attacks. Uh, North Korea does not have a ballistic missile anti-ship weapon that would threaten uh, the Carl Vinson strike group. The weapons that North Korea would put against uh, the Carl Vinson strike group are easily defended by the capabilities uh, resident in that strike group. Uh, if it flies, it will die if it's flying against uh, the Carl Vinson strike group. So I'm confident in that strike group's ability to not only defend itself, uh, but uh, to project power uh, if that is the, the call that, that, that we receive uh, from the President and the Secretary of Defense, sir. Okay. Well, then let me ask you more broadly about uh, missile defense. Uh, we have some um, uh, limited interceptors in Alaska and California. Uh, you mentioned some ships. We are uh, with the South Koreans installing THAAD. Uh, so there are several pieces of this. But would you agree with my proposition that we probably need to uh, amp up to increase our missile defense capability in this region. Uh, I, I agree with you completely, Mr. Chairman. I, I believe that across the, the range of integrated air missile defense, IAMD, uh, that we can and need to do more. Uh, I believe that the interceptors that we have that defend our homeland directly uh, in Alaska and California are critical. Uh, I have suggested that we consider uh, putting interceptors uh, in Hawaii that, that, that defend uh, Hawaii directly uh, and uh, that we, uh, we look at the uh, defense of Hawaii radar to improve Hawaii's capability. Uh, I believe that uh, the Flight 9 uh, DDGs, destroyers that are coming online, uh, are exactly what we needed in the ballistic missile defense uh, 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 space, if you will. Uh, and those are coming online, and I'm grateful to the, to the Congress for funding those. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Focusing on the Chairman's question in terms of uh, domestic defense, the missiles in Alaska uh, and in California, what greater capability do we need in those missiles? Do we not have enough? Are we not confident that the ones we have are going to work? Um, what capabilities is it that you're specifically focused on? Sir, I'm going out of my level of uh, my range of expertise because that's a question that, that NORAD is concerned more with, North American Air Defense Command. Uh, but I do believe that, that the numbers uh, uh, could be improved. In other words, we need more interceptors. Uh, and, and then I believe that for the defense of Hawaii, which is covered also uh, by those interceptors, uh, could uh, stand strengthening itself. And that's in terms of uh, the defense of uh, uh, Hawaii radar and potentially interceptors. So that's something we, we need to study much more uh, deeply, uh, but I think uh, it's, it certainly merits uh, uh, a further discussion. Uh, we have one of our key uh, systems uh, that's deployed now in the Pacific, the SBX radar. It's an X-band radar that's on an, oil, on an old uh, oil platform that's self-propelled with a golf ball-like antenna. We only have one of those. Uh, and it, we use it a lot, and, uh, uh, you know, we, we have to be concerned about uh, the material condition of the platform itself, which is old, uh, and the civilian uh, crews that man it. And what actions do you potentially see North Korea Kim Jong-un 
taking um, that, that are most concerning? And by that, I mean, putting aside for the moment what sort of capability they're building, what might they do offensively militarily? A few years back, um, I believe they sank a South Korean uh, vessel. They launched some missiles at a South Korean-controlled island. Uh, do you see similar things that North Korea could do? I mean, I, I don't think any of us anticipate that they're just going to do a full-scale war because they know the cost of that. But are there places where they would try to push the envelope? Um, and if so, what are your concerns about what they might do militarily against either our assets in the region or our allies? Yeah. Uh, sir, I, I, I'm, I'm not as certain uh, uh, about this as, as you are, that North Korea won't do something precipitous uh, because the... Well, I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm certain they are. I'm, ask, I'm asking what, what it would be. Um, well, I mean, sorry, it, it, could be, it could be what we've seen before. I mean, right. it, it, which provocations like the, the sinking of the Chonan or the attacks right. on the uh, Waipido Island uh, and, and the continuing uh, evolution of their nuclear uh, and their ballistic missile testing. Right, just, so all just, of that. Just to be clear in the purpose of the question, um, I, I'm not at all certain that they're not going to do something. I, I, I am confident, Admiral, I'm not certain of anything at this point in my life. It's just the nature of the world. But um, I am reasonably confident that North Korea sees the threat of launching a full-on war um, against South Korea or Japan um, and the consequences of that. What I'm worried about is that they will do these sort of little small things um, thinking they can get away with it um, and be wrong. And I'm trying to get a greater clarity of what those small things are, which is why I cited those, those two previous sure. examples. In the current environment, what are you worried about? Are they, are they likely to once again you know, try to sink a South Korean ship? Are there disputed territories that they might try to take over? Um, where should we be looking for that small thing that could lead to the larger, much more dangerous uh, war? First off, sir, I, I don't share your confidence that North Korea is not going to attack either South Korea uh, or Japan or the United States or our territories or our states or parts of the United States once they have the capability. I mean, Un unprovoked, do you think? That I, I'm, I, I, I'm, I, don't, I won't say that they will. But I, I don't share your confidence that they won't, ab with, a, with absolute uh, certainty that they won't do that. I think yeah. they... Not absolutely certain, just playing the percentages here, but right. go ahead. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I, I, I believe that, that we have to um, look at North Korea a, as if K Kim Jong-un uh, will do what he says. Uh, and, and there's a... Right now, uh, there's, there's probably a, a mismatch between KJU's rhetoric uh, and his capability. He has threatened by name Manhattan, Washington, Colorado, uh, Australia, Hawaii, uh, and there's a capability gap probably uh, in whether he can or not. But and I'm sorry to belabor this point because I want to get on to some other people here, but he, he's threatened those things in the context of don't mess with us. Um, has he, or are you saying he simply threatened them as he's going to do it no matter what we do? Sir, I, I can't read his mind. Uh, all I well, can I'm not do asking is, you to read his mind. All, all I, all I can do is, is understand what he says. And when he threatens the United States, uh, and then, then, then that's one level. But when he threatens the United States with the capability of, of, uh, of realizing that threat, that's a different place. Uh, and when that happens, that's an inflection point. And we're going to have to deal with that, I believe. I'll, I'll let other, other folks get in here. And this is probably more for a classified setting, but, but understanding why he threatens the United States, I think, is enormously important. And again, granting your point that there is no certainty, um, there is still things that we can learn to understand why those threats are made, and, and it would definitely inform how we, we would respond to those threats. So we can do that more in the classified setting. I'll yield back to uh, the committee. Thank you. Mr. Lamborn. Admiral, thank you for being here and for your service to our country. Um, if this needs to wait until the classified session, please say so. But one of the needs you highlighted in your written statement was more munitions. We're running short of some critical munitions. Would you want to elaborate on that, or should we uh, be more specific when we go up to the classified? Sure. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I can elaborate it, elaborate on it in general here, and then uh, would ask that that uh, we reserve the details for the uh, classified session. In, in general, uh, we're short on things like small diameter bombs. You know, these are these are uh, not exciting kinds of weapons. These are mundane sort of weapons, uh, but they're absolutely critical to what we're trying to do, uh, not only in North Korea uh, against North Korea, but also. Uh, in the fights uh, in the Middle East. And so uh, we have a shortage of small diameter bombs throughout the inventory. So the stockpile of small diameter bombs that PACOM has, for example, uh, we send them uh, to the fight we're in, and, and rightfully so, to CENTCOM, to Central Command and AFRICOM. And so that's the fight we're in, and, and they need them. And so, uh, you know, we send them there, and they use them, which is a good thing. But that means that they're going to be short again, and we're going to send some more. So that's the fight we're in. Uh, we're also short in uh, uh, AAW, anti-air warfare weapons like uh, AIM-9X and AIM-120Ds. Uh, these are weapons uh, uh, that uh, our fighter aircraft uh, use in air-to-air. -air. I can use more of those. Uh, and in a bigger sense, uh, the submarine issue itself. You know, I, I think our submarine uh, numbers uh, are low and getting smaller. Uh, and so the number of submarines, without going into the precise detail, uh, here, uh, the Navy can only meet about 50% of my stated uh, requirement for attack submarines. These are SSNs. Uh, by the end of the 2020s, uh, and, and that's, that's based on a submarine force today of 52 SSNs. By the end of the 2020s, that number is going to be down to 42. So the requirement I have is not going to get smaller but the percentage against the total number of submarines we have is going to, is going to be exacerbated uh, because of that. Uh, and so those are the kinds of munitions that I worry about. Also, you know, Mark 48 torpedoes uh, and, uh, and, and, and all of that. 